Well, it's good to be back here. The Party Boys debut <laughs> for the 2019 season. It's not been long season. enough for you to forget. It hasn't been long enough. And you know what? I think if you put Gormizer and me in a room with music, we will inevitably start dancing. There's just it's something just about so it. It's hard not to. The combination. It's like a deadly chemical <laughs> like com- combination where it just somehow it erupts into dancing just beauty. That's really the only way to describe it when you see it all in the glory here for today. We're heading into the North American bracket for the PML. If you've enjoyed Europe, you're definitely going to enjoy in a uh, nice weather outside. I can I can attest to that. We are in Atlanta. That's part of North America. Last time I checked. And Bork <laughs> and Team Zenith, they're going to be facing off to see who's going to face off against Ferocity in the finals. Ferocity already guaranteeing yeah. their spot in week four. And Ferocity, a familiar name. Bork, maybe not a familiar name, but there's probably only one player I've ever seen who yeah. has used that term regularly and who would ever be able to convince four other people that <laughs> to make his <laughs> team name Borg to the show first up of his name. in a bracket. You know, uh, some people give birth to dragons. Some people are the mother or father of, of Borgs, apparently. Uh, the father of Borgs. I think he has like this whole army, like army. navy. Like yeah. I don't know what's going on. The Bork <laughs> walkers. You Every know. now and then, Bidey will just like send me messages in Discord, <laughs> and it's like it will be his emotes, and I'm like, like these are, it's a dog wearing a bandana holding a machine gun. And I'm wow. like, it looks awesome, but every day, what's going on? Everyday Twitter traffic right there. <laughs> if you follow Paladins and their pros, especially <laughs> with this guy at the charge. Let's take a look at the maps and see what this Bork army will be able to do and where they'll be getting going. The ferocious, fun-loving puppers trying to take a couple of wins here today and advance to the finals. Of course, it's not going to be that easy team. Zenith trying to uh, create some synergy themselves. Jaguar Falls will be the place. Again, another Warders Gate ban. I'm seeing that a lot simply just because of the fact that they, they don't want to risk it on a newer map. Yeah. Um, but we would love to see that one of these days, but we're going to have to wait. I'm wondering if that's going to be one of those maps that for open qualifiers and even maybe in week four, even though we have the, all of the teams kind of compiled, yeah, it's going to be banned. And then the minute the regular season starts, teams are going to be throwing it out left and right. See what they can do on it. It's I'm sure possible. it's being practiced it's in possible. the background, just hasn't quite been pulled out. And look at the difference in North America already, William. We're seeing Koga banned out and Inara and Makoa. That's standard with the Torvald, but Makoa, uh, excuse me, Koga and Torvald actually getting the ban slot. It's gonna open up this big game, Cassie, which in Europe is heavily banned due to the yeah. fact that she just counters so much of what the sustained meta tries to bring. And I mean, with big bodies like Khan making it through, Inara banned out this game, but we've seen them on the same team today. We have seen them yeah. show a lot of strength. Ash, West, very West, similarly in there. Fernando still open as well. So. You have things like big game casting yeah. making that big difference because of how important front lines have been and continue to be. I like Barrick here too Come with Ash. Away. Gives a nice semblance of a lot of aggression and also decent sustain. More decent than you would probably give on paper. The actuality of the multiple rocket boost da boots dashes and just the fact that Ash with her seed shield can have it up almost 100% of the time makes it for a very difficult kind of front line uh, vanguard to break. My favorite thing about Ash, and this was like a small tech thing I learned, actually, when we were interviewing a player at some point in oh, December really? while we were doing one of our shows, I think Bees had mentioned that if you dash with her, it immediately grounds you. And we actually got to see that right. a little bit right. during the last game, but it's one of those small things that you don't think about consciously, unless I think you know. you're at this level. But when you make that play, when it makes a difference, it means the world to your team. And when you have a Cassie, a Tyra, you keep your Ash alive, you put them in the front line to kind of shield them. It gives your team a lot of kind of glass cannon power. Certainly. And uh, we now see the Grover and the Maldamba. These are two that haven't been paired very much together. We see the Grover and maybe some uh, Grok, maybe some Pip, but two what uh, many would consider main healers now. And I would expect that means the Grover is going to be able to flex into deep roots, which has been something North American players have talked about uh, executing on the Saris for what feels like the first time today, unless you guys saw it in that final set. Yeah, first time for Saris and another Tyra. And I love seeing it come through. Saris has been the one that I think is probably going to see the most rise. Like, mm, Grover yeah. was always wanting to be there. Certain teams wanted to make him work. North America more than Europe. But right. everyone wanted him to be around. Saris was like Bitey. Bitey would play Saris, and that was the only That's one. True. He's not even over there. But her coming through, having, again, Voidabides kind of baked into the kit. She can heal multiple people and still get Mortal Reach, so she can do it from really far away. Yep. It sets her up to get her ults up a little more often. You can now buy Kronos as well as a Mirage boost as a support so it is making things a lot easier i think for her to just showcase so much success mm. and that's really what is uh core about these compositions 
the success of them together relative to the success of the individual champion's potential. I've seen a lot of teams, especially in that first set, draft a lot of Grover, but it didn't really work in the application of it. And boy, oh boy, are we really going to see Stun Damba here from Bidey? I, I don't know <laughs> if that's a flex right now or if we're really going to see it, but that would be fantastic if Wakono's Wrath does come out. We're just barely hovering over it. <laughs> Not it's, quite, huh? I it's mean, suspense. he's left the base now, so wow. it's going to be there. It's locked Stun Damba. And this is the only kind of thing you can pull when you have two supports, right? Like, if you didn't have a Grover with you, yes, sir. you could not pull this off. But, I mean, look at the setup already. A stun making a big difference. He can go into deft hands and make this impact even more. Well, Bidey, you know, I think is one for experimentation. He's one for innovation. I think he's one of the leading minds in Paladins because he's always theory crafting. And you can see it coming out here. Not yet able to see this in competitive play anywhere Oof. in Paladins official esports history. So he is the first to really bring out the stun Damba in 2019. And uh, somebody else is going to have to do him up here. Maybe get some uh, Wakono's curse after this to follow <laughs> up the play. And I'm going to have to give this team credit. Bork has probably two of the best theoretical minds and paladins coming down from Bidey and Kresnik together. Yep. Them being able to come in, like I expect to see more things like this from a team that has players that are constantly Man. theory crafting. It's like having your own meta pusher, except you have two of them, <laughs> and they're all playing for it. So it's a little different than the case for Team Envy, but it's still going to be comfortable for them being able to kind of keep themselves up Ooh. and find these little changes that will give them a lead. Unfortunate. Mage Monkey, if he hits that shoulder bash, probably wins the duel, but then Toa is able to break out. And the thing about this Stun Dama is I see the application. Bidey's just doing a ton of work, but what is it really gaining? I'm not sure. Toa goes down there. The King Bomb, not good enough. Watkins finds him there, and a beautiful convergence sets up both Snakes and Bidey. They're going to go down. Stun Damba. So what? Team Zenith take objective number one. Watkins, a name that you should recognize if you've been hanging around the scene for a while. Going to be running the Tyra and finding the final kill of that engagement. Also rocking the new Valentine skin. Credit to that. Heartbreaker. As he comes in. But, uh, I mean, this is a, another pick, again, that hasn't seen as much light until Season 2 changes. Certain yeah. things about Tyra have just kind of been enhanced. And, again, a lot of it comes down to the grenade. But it depends on your play style. Hunting party as well as big game. Like, all three of her talents are going to be useful depending on the scenario. She is such a versatile pick now. Yeah, and I think uh, a lot of people picked up onto the damage reduction for the nade launcher build, and people are running that quite a bit. Um, I like the flexibility of, of Mercy Kill uh, when utilized. Yeah. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, I love the way they changed that because I didn't really like the two iterations prior. Um, I like the original Mercy Kill, but then once it got to max health percentage or something like that, I wasn't really a big fan. Now, Heartbreak of Tyra back in a position to be breaking some hearts and breaking some shields. It's Kresnik. Holds that one up on the con. Mage Monkey and the rest of the squad. Flame Effects right behind him, trying to push back this corridor. Doing whatever they can. Tyra Cassie, kind of a pincer. If you get between the two of them, you're going to lose your health. Nice fast. But Watkins incredibly low, does fall back. And that's going to be the Whirlwind coming down, but it's not going to be enough to say Toa or Loomzy. When you hit the gas pedal here, Watkins has a decision. Maybe he doesn't need it, but there's two supports in front of him, and that's just damage Ooh. all the way home. He is going to walk this one up through the most difficult choke point. And Jaguar Falls with a minute left. I was uh, interested to see this Bork line up, but oftentimes these crazy concepts take a minute to pan out in actuality. Yeah. And this is actually one of those areas as well. You're seeing a couple of teams, especially being the first week of open qualifiers. Yeah. A lot of people have been bouncing around, finding a home. All right. You have to wonder how long they've been practicing together. Bork has been notable. Bidey has been one of the more notable players, even though he was always on a team that was relatively lower in the bracket during yep. the PPL. This is his chance to shine with the rest of the squad. And as of right now, they're doing another good job being able to push back Zenith, something we haven't seen today, or at least didn't get to see out of Sour Team that often. But if they can hold, that's where it really matters. Can you get something meaningful out of this pushback? Can you at least keep them at bay long enough to make the timer go down? Bidey is one of the most, just back on that conversation with 15 seconds left, one of the most full range experienced Paladins oh, players yeah. we've ever had because he actually has experienced a lot of the defeat. He's experienced some of those poor times and also some of the highest times, uh, which he just can't say about everybody. And right here, he's trying to defend against what seems like an impossible task. Great stuns, but it's just not gonna be enough. It's a full white, Bork is all dead, a deicide. Team Zenith will push this one through, guaranteed. Uh, and it looks like this snake is going to have to bring a little bit more venom for these stuns to mean something. Being able to do a, a lot while also not being able to find as much. Bitey, 
and again, this kind of goes back onto that conversation, has probably played the most roles I've seen competitively as well. Most roles. But being able to find these stuns, you need follow-up. That's kind of the big thing for Amal Damba. Finding a good Dread Serpent, finding a beautiful stun, even finding some good damage yep. is never going to be enough on your own. You have to have someone behind you running the double support, the double right. front line. Right. I'm looking towards Loomsy and Toa as you have to carry. You have to make sure every single shot you fire is not only finding its home, but it is making sure it gets a kill. And I'm curious to see Khan's loadout here because uh, what he's given up in terms of his loadout, uh, on, yeah, and I thought, into the breach. So they're basically saying, Meldamba, no more Swift Spirits for you because he's running possession, he's running the reload speed, and so he's not going to be amping uh, his team up moving-wise. It's going to be Kresnik's job who's going to get that 24% movement speed. It's not the same thing, not as efficient of a cooldown, and not as high of a movement speed buff. But it is going to help augment something that you usually see brought with Maldamba compositions. These fights just aren't being taken with clarity. And there's a Dread Serpent. Fighty says, let's get Mage Monkey. And they find it. What can they get off of this? Dome Shield going to get popped. And that's going to open up a lot of room. You just avoid it for a while. And now you can get aggressive on Nini Nini. Kind of locked into the corner and just eats wow. a rocket to the face. As well as a couple of miniguns. Which makes it a lot easier to work with comeback mechanic. They've been controlling this point. They took this fight exactly the oh, way they Oh, boy. To. Hello. Hi. And goodbye. Watkins. That is the one character that you do not really want a stun Dama to be around because that crossfire doesn't mean you're CC immune, buddy, and a stun could throw off all of that DPS if properly timed. Mage Monkey still back alive and good healing there from both the Grover and the Dama. This is where things get rough. Can Baller Steve save them? He's on an eight streak. He's got to touch. He's just going to back off, save that streak, not die and Borks will capture this objective. And that's exactly what we needed. First round, we got to see how often Bidey's hitting these stuns. You see he's hitting them nonstop. It is yeah. almost always happening. This time, Loomsy, you see the follow-up. You see the damage coming through. You see how impactful these snakes can be and what it can mean for someone like a Ruckus who just clears house whenever somebody happens to be stunned in front of them. Makes it a lot easier to capture the point and starts off this push beautifully, almost halfway with pretty much no real snags. It's clear the sustain is fine for both teams. I don't think they're failing in terms of this concept. And, you know, it would be one thing if, oh, they're not getting enough healing. I think that's okay. These fights are lasting quite a while. But Toa, to me, seems like the one who put himself in a position to succeed. Last we, last time, we saw him not actually trading out very well uh, uh, against some of these backline damage dealers. His King Bomb went disappointingly he died right after and that's what snowballed the first fight presented but now that he's on a five streak starting to find some kills this is going to mean a lot for the borkers if he can get going setting themselves up mage monkey kind of locked down does get out of there yeah but at what Unlucky. cost honestly it's going to be a lot of ground gained by bork as they're coming around this corner looking to potentially Bobby. get their own to us could have got him off the ledge that was a uh, little bit not great executed. This is what I'm talking about. If you can just not let those kills slip by, it's a completely different game. This team could be steamrolling. And now Bidey says, listen, no one's going to kill this guy. Let me step into the front and try to do it. He sacrifices his life. The rest of the team knows it's going to be a regroup for them. Snakes might as well just fall off the map, and he decides to do so with the help of Watkins and Mage Monkey. A minute left, so you still have plenty of time to regroup and come back in, but you have to figure out how you need to open the door, right? High ground has been given over to Zenith, and they're going to be able to control window. They have a lot of ability. Watkins, where he is, completely cauterized, completely stunned out. Sarah's healing him did not even matter to Bork. They threw his health bar almost like it's nothing, and that's the kind of kill you need. Saris is a very good healer. She brings the AoE and she brings the single target. It's been very difficult to get Mage Monkey down. I think it's just target prioritization. There needs to be a little bit more clarity from the Borkers to really succeed here on the push. They still will probably get it done. Great pickup by Kresnik. Poppy Bomb missed by Toa, but they have the resources to do it. They almost bait the Dome Shield. Wow but they're going to tie it up. My only worry is now, can you just keep building on this? As you can see, their Bomb King, their main DPS, 0 and 4. That's got to change if this is going to work out for the Borkers. Six and four for Loomsy, though. So kind of, I want to say, bouncing back and forth. I feel like it should be way more on the Bomb King, but at least we're seeing an impact from Ruckus Flame, a very notable player. You might recognize right. him from some of the games that he got to play during the fall split for G2. Still showing up, still doing really well on Cassie. Not too much of a surprise for anyone who recognizes him. Although it is a little bit different because, again, you see him with a couple of players you would recognize, like Watkins. But a couple of names that you would only be familiar with if you're playing potentially either in the minor league qualifiers yep. or in your ranked games. So coming in, being able to showcase, again, a lot of talent, but you're relying on, I want to say, two staple players making things work. Now, Bidey is invested into Deft Hands, too. He's already got 20%, so it's putting him stat-wise at 65% 
reload speed. That is going to have diminishing returns, so he's not going to have as much of that. Just one kill! Oh, beautiful stuff, Toa. He might have just made up for it there, essentially negating the Ash Ultimate as he pushes her out of the Assert Dominance range, makes her vulnerable, and they pick up the kill to the front line. And a beautiful set two cauterized threes online for the team makes it a lot easier to just stop this Ceres from doing what she does best. And that's what's been locking them down so hard. Bombs are still oh, flying, making sure no. they're in this corner. Yeah, Toa loses his life, but look at his team. They are built around this point. Unfortunately, they're going to get pushed back. And this is going to be the moment of truth. Oh. Convergence came through, and they're picking up some kills. And Flame and Watkins are really just outperforming on a DPS side. I mean, I don't know where this statement, where this game is if they're not doing what they're doing. Uh, the front lines and the supports are evening each other out. Baller Steve, Mage Monkey, Ninny, they're doing well. I mean, so is Kresnik, so is Bidey, so is Snakes. I like the way they're kind of walking around these fights, but they need someone to finish. And right now, big game Cassie, she's just a, a beast that cannot be controlled. This may just be the reason uh, this has not looked like a good matchup and maybe why Europe is decided to really keep her banned. And I'd love to be able to see because it feels like she's gone into the Wrecker as well, which is yeah. one of those things that when you're looking at things, and it is Wrecker 2 right there, as yeah. well as some resilience for all of the team, but the Wrecker is the thing that's most notable. Everyone else has cauterized, yeah. but this is a, I'm going to kill Ruckus. Yeah. No, this is a, yeah. Ruckus is my target. If he gets in front of me, I've got big game to deal with his health, and I now have Wrecker 2 to deal with his shielding. As well as 1,500 credits in the pocket, so anything that can come after this is going to be big. And that's assuming they even have time to spend it right now. Yeah. Zenith are pretty much rolling right into the base of Bork with no real snags. Yeah, and you know, forcing that shield down from Kresnik as well is another great reason uh, to use the record. Toa, not able to finish that one off yet again. It's been a disappointing introduction to the PML for him. I'm sure they're hoping for more in game two, which inevitably looks like we'll be going uh, in terms of Borker trying to just tie this thing up, but it's not quite over. Zenith. Not able to push. They're going to back off. Borker still living, albeit uh, on, a, I would assume, life support here. And I have to get something going. Holding on as best they can, but it's so difficult, I think, at this point in a game to nice. find a good position to defend yeah. as well as make sure you aren't using anything too much, right? You don't mm -hmm. want to go out and use an ult. You want to make sure you have everything still in your pocket because if this goes 3-3 three, three, and right. you go in with no ults, you are pretty much handing the game over. But you want to force this convergence. You want to force this assert dominance without letting them pick anything up for it. You have to be able to make those trades. But unfortunately, it seems like it's a little challenging to find the right positioning. Bidey trying to focus between his stuns and his healing. There's yeah. kind of a, a I want to say a push and pull vibe to his gameplay. There, there really is. He, he knows that they've got Resilience 3. The entire team of Zenith has really decided that we're going to make sure we're not getting stunned out with the um, abundance of stuns that are coming through from Bidey and the immense reload speed that he has. Bidey's still going to get the damage. It's still going to do 700, but it's just not going to get them out of this fight. And especially when Tyra has that crossfire, it won't negate her DPS as much as it might have had she not bought Resilience. So far, looking like a pretty decent Jeez. stun. 1,100 damage versus what this will bring to you. But he's got to keep him alive. Loomzy has been picking up a lot of these last hits. It's going to be up to him to finish off this fight because they're looking to make one final push here on Team Zenith. Grouping up around the payload. Overtime is going to start ticking, and this is going to be pretty much the death barrier, right? Yeah. You're going to walk in. You are between two very, very close walls, and everyone's going to be looking for you, but the fireball is going to come out. The damage is so far so good, but no one's fallen either yet. Mage Monkey Ninny both going down, and that's going to be more than all she wrote. That's the front line's gone. Yeah. No one's going to be able to stand on that payload. And Loomzy gets Watkins. Vidi finds Ninny. There's a lot of damage coming from, uh, you know, unusual sources, and maybe that's the game plan. That's how you might be able to do it to really find some success here, getting some kills from places they don't think they should be coming from. And I'm actually really happy. Not only are we seeing Bidey, I want to say find success kills with this kind of loadout, but you're also seeing what the mindset behind it is. Every single time during that, like, minute we watched yeah. him fire one shot throw a stun fire a shot yeah. throw a stun and more often than not he's double tapping people he's hitting them for a good chunk of their damage if it's a cassie if it's a, a tyra they're half health all of a sudden they yeah, get taken down two. and even though his healing isn't at the top of the charts i don't think that's his goal i think that is where the grover comes in his focus is going to be that utility he is just a stun machine yeah grover already Showing a couple of axes onto the point. Ninny could be in trouble. An early dome shield just to secure it might come out here. You'll see Kresnik and the rest of the boys just rotating, holding down this left side. Nothing to be afraid of quite yet, Gore. Both teams just feeling each other out. 
18% picked up for Zenith, but it's not really enough of a lead to feel comfortable trying to figure out how to get into this room without giving away too much. Uh -oh. Build Shield is available. Oh, pulls a lot! The kills, but they're not going to be able to go through. Into the stun! stun! And that's going to be at least two kills. Oh, we're playing Smash Bros. Here we play Paladins, the combos, <laughs> baby! Take me back to Genesis. These guys are going in, and that is what Saris and Ash can bring to it. Oh my goodness, what execution. And you gotta say, Bork kind of let themselves be executed on there, all grouping up in that room. And now it's looking hopeless. The Dome Shield oh. just to secure it. I don't know how long Kresnik is gonna last. This King Bomb is not gonna blow much up, but he does find one. If he stays alive, it could be big, but he goes down to Mage Monkey. We do have Hex of Fire coming through, trying to find whatever uh -oh. they can. The kills are looking big. Watkins goes down. That's three That's huge. for one overall. Zenith have to give up the point. 99% picked up for them, though. And with 1% <gasps> of a tick, that's all they need. But the dismounts are coming through. The control is coming through. Bork, they have reestablished themselves. You need a good zone here. All the ultimates have been used, but they still have the whirlwind for Bork. Things have turned. Tables have been lifted and uprooted. And now Grover trying to just keep everybody with some strong roots into this objective capture because if they step off for even a moment, it's gonna be teams in this game. The whirlwind goes through, keeping everyone nice and healthy. Flame effects is still there though, and they're worried about that big game, Cassie. Doing whatever they can, axes are being hurled. This is gonna be the fight that matters. Can Flame find the kill? No, he gets pushed Huge. out, stays alive, and he's gonna be able to loop around the side, trying to find the damage, but the control is in favor of Bork right now. They're he the goes ones down. on the point. Watkins trying to finish it off as well, but I think it's gonna be Bork who do it. Oh my goodness, the turnaround. Around. And at the end of the day, the Saris spray is the last word said in this one. They make up for what was an unusual start to that round and an unusual composition and find the win amongst the odds, against the odds, truly. Great performance there from Bork to tie it up. And there were a lot of things where it's like, okay, is this going to work? Like, you could see them formulating, like, let's try this out, see what happens. But once it hit that 3-2 mark or that 3-3 mark even going into the last round, a lot is going on in their mind. And they make a huge misplay. Like, that, for all intents and purposes, was not their game. They have two people get stunned, immediately killed off at the beginning of the round. It is only the fact that it is a tied score. There's no comeback mechanic for either team that even lets them start the beginning of a fight back. And you got to say that King Bong from Toa as well yeah. finds a kill, helps to set up another one and get some stuns off so that Loomzy could pick up another kill. I mean, you know, you look at the stats, you KDA is not everything that matters there. There's a lot more that says the story of how he contributed to that team's win. <laughs> As we head into the maps for game two, I'll be excited to see if we see more wonky stuff or uh, if it will continue more traditionally here at Paladins. But it's season two. It's 2019. Throw everything you know out into the water. Uh, we're, we're in a new game here, apparently. I mean, everything, especially with the way that game went, it's kind of up in the air. It doesn't necessarily matter who's finding all of the kills. It just matters when you're finding them, as was showcased by Bork. And now you're going to Stone Keep a lot that can be similar, yeah. as well as being different. The point a little bit more open, and by a little bit, I mean a lot. There's way more opportunity to shoot from a high ground from far away to kill members that are standing on the capture point or to flank around. You're a little bit more covered, just similar to Jaguar Falls. So some push, some pull, maybe some changes coming through, but Bork, I think have the mentality behind it. I don't know if we're going to see Domba Stun right. Machine Part 2, but it could always come through. No, it did feel like they're willing to to do you those things and throw people here. off. I'm sure Zenith have some ideas that Bidey is going to do something interesting or unique. Every team that he's ever played on has always had a unique approach to Paladins. And so I would expect Stay nothing less me. when this PML team is competing for a spot in the PML during these qualifiers. However, the way that it's showing up could change depending on game. You know, you see the Grover Ash here. We may, we may not see the Damba again. We may yeah. switch onto a Pip and may see Grover Deep Roots setting up for some Catalyst, some easy evil mojos. You never know with this team. Pray to your Cassie's gods. still available, and I think Cassie's this probably going to be a big pickup here. Not. Potentially a Leon as well, but something yeah. to deal with the health bars, the shielding, the damage that needs to be dealt in order to kill an Inara and a Fernando Koga. Being hovered over oh was banned last goodness. game. Oh my goodness. Unpicked really so far today. Again. Bomb King comes through. But will the King of Claws get picked himself? Wow. So uh, strong, strong favorite uh, here in North America. Koga and the Claws have come out and terrorized a lot of people lately. Uh, this would expect, I would expect to then see a Luminary Genos at the end of this, but it would go counter to the sustain style with the double front line. They'd have to be operating off of two supports and only the Ash to do it. Do they feel confident enough with the Code Claws without it being augmented by a Torvald or Genos? And they do.
Uh, and they're going to be able to go in with the Ruckus as well. So they have a lot more aggression, I would say, on the side of Borg this time around. Man. they This is a team that can't really be defensive. Like, right. Ash is the most defensive champion they have, and that's saying something. Ash is not known for sitting on the point, whereas Fernando, Anara, even Victor, Leon, they're going to sit back. They're going to be relaxed a yeah. little bit more. But there's a lot more pressure on that Victor, on that Leon, to perform, to be up to that standard. Right. Whereas Koga, if he gets in your face, like, if you're Victor or Leon, you might as well kiss your life goodbye. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Leon might have a way to get away with Manifest Destiny. She might be able to create some space if she hits a really good uh, imminence and, and yeah. presence shot. But it is worrisome because that Koga just will win against the Victor. There's no doubt about it. If he gets up in Victor's face with the claws, it's game over. So the game really for Victor is can you keep Koga away? Can you keep yourself out of the line of sight of the madman who has just been terrorizing casual games across the realm? <laughs> Causing a lot of trouble for people. I would say yourself, myself, more than likely <laughs> included against what has been something very difficult. The diehard Lumsy now switching from the Ruckus onto this Koga and Bidey picking Koga up the Ruckus loadout. for this. I'm curious to see if he's going to be as focused into the claws. And so far, it seems like he is looking towards that stance. Ooh, I like it. Okay, so for the speed boost on agility, a little bit of health, but really going for a little bit of jump height and then the maximum amount of just damage uh, lifesteal. That's the big key there. Yeah. And what you're going to see is some of these skewers used for some vertical mobility. Not all the time, but you will see it sometimes. Koga is not invincible. This is not the best spot for Koga, but because he's getting healed, it's okay. He just doesn't have a great health pool. 1950 puts him on a very low side for a damage dealer, especially in comparison to a Cassie. But here's the benefit of it. The range that you can get from this thing. Koga is not only a melee threat, he is a distance threat as well. And Baller Steve is in trouble. He knows it. It's a full wipe. Welcome to the Koga Claws, everybody. And it's looking beautiful. And again, his loadout focused on keeping himself alive, plus the healing that's going to be coming in from the Grover. Like, everything that's kind of piling onto this Koga yeah. is just focused on high damage output without losing pretty much any of your life. I mean, I don't know if I've seen him drop below 1,900 much. No. And if then, it's not gotten below 1,600 for healing. sure. With everything going his way, even though it's such a low health pool, he's comfortable. Yeah, I mean, with healing, that's the thing. You play Koga by yourself. When you're in your casual games and this Koga's doing this, he's not getting a pocket healed by a Maldamba or a Grover. I mean, in this competitive situation is why Koga's been rated so highly in that SSS kind of tier by a lot of people who are doing those Paladins tier lists because he just, he's that good without a pocket. With a pocket, yeah. it's nearly impossible to break him down unless you have an insane amount of focus in 1v1, forget about it. Everything pretty much going his way. Just sitting on the side. I don't even feel like anyone's looking at him. Hexafire charged up and used. Oh, nice. And this is looking for the kill. Damage oh, is coming through. Oh, nice Lucy's ult. Still alive. Ults for the immunity. Doesn't even care about getting the kills because he does enough damage without it. And now the kills are starting to fly their way. Flame in a hard place. Does take down Bitey. Wow. But it's not going to be enough to find a point. Toa's like, did you guys forget that I'm playing this game? I think uh, Team Zenith, no offense to Toa, just were like, listen, we have kind of some big problems here with this Koga who just will freaking die. Just, I'm sorry. Forever alive. Like, I, I've, I've dealt with you, Bomb King, for a long time. This Koga Claws thing, I'm still getting used to it, okay? <laughs> Koga Claws is the fresh wound. Bomb yeah. King is an old wound. It's yeah. kind of scabbed over. Like, you know it's there. You yeah, have the scars. <laughs> exactly. But it's just going to exist. You, you're living with it. I'm not pissed about it anymore. It's like, you know, I'm, I've, gotten, I've grown to look with it. It's kind of charming now when you think about it. But this one, oh, no. This one, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get away get away from as fast as possible. And, uh, yeah, I mean, we're noticing the, the benefit, Gore, of not only the loadout for the individual, but with the team. That's where it's going to yes. snowball. That's where we'll see the potential. We're not seeing any damage amp here, so imagine that hitting uh, for 745 instead of the 650. Imagine that hitting for 845 with the Torvald bubble. All these things are possible. <laughs> you will see them in 2019 until these claws are nerfed. And uh, it's been awesome to kind of see this new introduction of Koga in a real legit way, especially in North America here, finally going down for the first time in the game, thanks to Watkins. And a couple of kills that are going to be big pickups right there just to stall and delay. And also burst mode coming down of that. here as well for Watkins. It's something that we haven't seen. Shrapnel has kind of been the thing, I want to say, reigning supreme. Yep. But burst mode fits so comfortably into, I want to say, the play style, the way that Victor feels. Yeah. And people will underestimate it, but it's a really good way to get quick burst. And you're right. And Predator, getting some lifesteal. Uh, I actually really like that idea. And, you know, I've been noticing a lot of Victor players using burst mode. It's pretty devastating. A lot more damage than I was expecting. 
and uh, Watkins is using that quite well, but unfortunately, Bidey with a beautiful Hexafire there. This man loves him some Ruckus. Uh, was kind of the <laughs> inventor of the aerial assault Ruckus style in North America, which just dominated uh, the meta for quite a long yeah. time. And it's going to be a 2-0 push here on Stone Keep. Looking good for Team Bork, who, yes, innovating in, a mini in many ways, but also just keeping it simple. I mean, sometimes back to basics while running something new, right? You have four out of five of this is tried and true. Grover, Ash, Bomb King, Ruckus. You know exactly what you're going to expect from them. If you've been watching for the last year, even a month, mm -hmm. you're going to know kind of where they fall into it. It is going to be the Koga that is like the fresh take yeah. for this game, whereas the Stun Mall Damba was the last game. And Koga, I want to say, working a little bit better than the Stun Mall Damba, oh, yeah. at least in terms of control and damage. Yeah. But it found its place in this role. And, of course, Toa this time, I'm going to give him a lot of credit, too, having a much better performance this time around. I agree. I mean, I, I think a lot of it is because the pressure isn't on him in that last matchup. True. It was either Ruckus or him who were pretty much getting kills. And I think now you have, obviously, with only one support, the option to flex another damage dealer, and that is relieving a lot of the pressure from BK, who admittedly, unless you're playing that chain reaction style the way we saw Simsulu play it, he's great damage, but it's not as easy to confirm kills with this high sustained, super tanky meta, uh, very much like the Koga, who can do that Pretty much no problem here if he gets into the back line. 66% for teams in it. They've sent an R onto the point. It is working. Now you've got to make a move. You see the Koga going into the Blade Storm. And now Watkins finding Loomsy, though. This could be a problem. Taken out as he's trying to get away. Was pretty much there for like a second, right out of the immunity, but the damage was ready. But everybody on Xena is still getting pushed back. Comeback mechanic gets them to 66% where they're going to be happy with it. They can still fight back. But Bork get right in their face, start pushing them back, find their control. The high ground where Toa has been has been probably my favorite. If you have someone protecting him up there, he has so many angles to play around the point that he can find kills almost like it's nothing. Yeah. Good heals from so uh, from Snakes as the solo heal healer. Good wall from Ninny, but it feels like delaying the inevitable. And that's a good immortal. It's going to give Ninny some time, and he needs it. Flame effects getting pressured out by Bidey. You know Bidey wants this kill, and now Mage Monkey to the rescue. Bidey forced back. He needs a heal from Snakes, who has not died. Objective still captured by Bork. We missed it. But behind the action, Fernando gets caught chasing, and he loses what he came to chase. Unfortunate there for Team Zenith, who had a really nice round, but again, Fork just a little bit quicker to get the deed done. And I think you're seeing something that I'm, I'm actually positive that this team that Bork went in with the knowledge of, they have body at low health. They yeah. pull Fernando completely away from the point, just trying to chase a kill that, yeah, he gets it, but right. at what cost? The entire point, potentially the game, which would put Bork at one point for the set to right. try and find the win. And then they do it almost immediately again. You see Toa get low, and he pulls Fernando out. Mage Monkey is starting to chase a couple kills that maybe he shouldn't be. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, frustration because when you see front lines operating in that role, uh, it's very difficult. You know, you know that they're not getting the kills elsewhere. You know sure. that Flame Effects isn't picking up the kills the way he was on the big game Cassie. That's why we're seeing Europe ban it. Leon is amazing, but depending on the composition, you're going to want your big game Cassie to just get rid of these tanks so quickly. The passive is still outrageous. 10% max health for six seconds? I mean, not only does it last forever, it's just so much damage when you're scaling off of 5,200 health like a Fernando uh, on the enemy team. Well, a minute 10 left on the clock. King Bomb rolling through. Doesn't even need it. That one was, I think, a lot more cut and dry. And, I mean, also looking at cut and dry, maybe black and white. Yeah. The Inara in that game, Ninny kind of virtually impossible to find because he was dead for a majority of it or <laughs> knocked away from the One point. One with the, the Versus ground. what we saw earlier where like Ovim is dominating on yeah. this and that's kind of the difference in playstyles. And Nara has been touted as this amazing front line, but you have to have the right back line for it to work. You do. Let's take a look at the post-game stats here because I would be interested to see uh, some of the damage output, some of the healing numbers as well, uh, comparatively with the Grover and the Maldamba. And you can see Grover beating out the Maldamba there. Baller Steve, though, doing a good job to even stay in, uh, I think, comparison with him. Toa finally gets himself in the top damage conversation, at least for his team. Watkins takes that one, however, for the total of the game. And I like the fact that the healing is as close as it is because it kind of showcases that it wasn't really lost in terms of healing. Sometimes we yeah. see games where it's like 128,000 to 30,000. That yeah. is a very vast, but 105 isn't far behind, especially for a team that got 4 owed. It is in terms of the damage. When you're looking at 48K coming down from Flame, even though he's still finding a lot, even though he's applying pressure, he wasn't as important, I want to say, as Koga was throughout the entire game. A lot of pressure that came down between him and Toa that just opened up the doors. Yeah, I mean, when you compare it, right? 1,200 damage as we take a look at map three from a Leon hitting a max distance presence. 
without any anti-heal because that's not on her kit anymore. Uh, it's not the same as, as a Cassie who's able to then, with a disengage, every single basic attack. I mean, say Presence has to wait one, two seconds. That's a fast reset of that cooldown. Every basic attack hitting for 1,200, basically, you know? So I, at that point, I think you realize why Cassie's being banned, why Leon is acceptable sometimes in these matchups, and how it can be very difficult if the angles aren't right and you can't burst somebody down quick enough uh, with these high-level tanks and these big, big healers. Uh, the, the fight's going to just go on forever. Yeah. Going to the land of Snow Frozen Guard for this one. Bomb King, I think, is still notable. This is one of the maps that we've seen him, and I feel like he's always been like, some teams love him, some teams hate him yeah. on this map. He's yeah. very polarized. But Kinesa Strix, the first time, and I think the only time today, that we're going to see two sniper bands mm. come through because there are only maybe three maps that it's going to make that big of a difference. But there's so much on the table now because right. of that. Right. Hey, I, I hear you. I think uh, Knessa Strix is just to keep things simple. <laughs> Honestly, I think we it's just... We don't want to have to deal the, with it. The problem is, I think they're like, you know what? I, I don't... It, it could just put a, uh, an unsolvable equation in because you don't have the right flank to get to the Knessa and Strix. You just can't win the game because they're just... Sure. They fight all... Now, nice. if you got a Khan and Barrack, you got some strong front lines to deal with. Maybe you leave the big game Cassie open or maybe you take it yourself. They're not going to... They're going to take the Koga, but they say, at least we could... We know how to win and take fights against these characters. Koga fits into such a weird area for this as well because it's it's that area where Sunday you think flanks Kona. on this map, I'm thinking Eevee. And that's like pretty much the only one maybe a Zen can yeah, come through. Right. Koga has that rare mobility where yes he's going to be damage. immune, he can get that right. damage but right. because of the range of the claws it opens him a lot more than what we would see. Maybe only Yomi Zen could actually pull off in a similar manner. Oh no. You put it with a Torvald and a Grover and this man is not only going to kill you fast, I don't know if we're ever going to actually see his health dip. Well, it's the other brilliant of the Knessa Strix ban. You know, I've been talking about Lex, and I think he's actually got some potential rise power here. I, I've been playing a lot of him, and I've been experimenting a lot with him. I, I talked about it in my tier list that I did. I thought, I said, Lex is, I wouldn't be surprised if he climbs up. I think people are undervaluing heroism. I think there's yeah. some, knowing Bidey, he won't run heroism, and they will run uh, any other talent that's to like, <laughs> be like, no, 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 this is the one. Trust me, this is the one, I say. But the big game, Cassie and Leon, that's a scary pair as well. I'd say Leon is uh, a really good valuation for Zenith because, uh, you know, you get max distance presences sure. a lot more often here. And I actually like this because both Cassie and Leon can look towards that record. They can deal with these bubbles a lot more. And I think that's why they scoop up both. Normally, you might see a team go for a blaster here. Maybe they want something different. They want, but... Leon Cassie is going to be tried and true. This is yep. going to be perfect for what they're up against. You can get a Cauterize on one, Wrecker on the other, pop the bubbles on Koga and Lex, then stop the healing, try to cut the lifesteal off. Lex. But, I mean, you're going to have to deal with an Execute from Lex, the Lexicute, as I like to call Lexicuted. it. Executed. But, I mean, there's so much that can go right and go wrong with Lex that I'm, I'm on the fence about this game because I think four out of five members for Bork are perfect. <laughs> Lex is in that area where... I'm much like you. Like, I want to see Lex be successful. Right. I just haven't seen it yet, so I'm very timid about it. You know, he's such a unique champion, and, yep, it's Discovery. I knew it. I knew Bidey was just not going <laughs> to. There's no way. Bidey had to do his own thing and be like, no, this is the play. You go Discovery because you get the bonus damage and you see the. Let's, I need to see Bidey's uh, loadout as well. The loadout as well as the Oh, the actually there it is. It. So the hot, the lifesteal really is what he's focusing on. I think Wicked Don't Rest is another level 5 card I have for Lex. Because basically you just, you get your dash back so much. Hit four shots and you get your dash back instantly. Um, and it's a really, really strong card. He gets a little bit of extra health, some ammo. And then, of course, he gets his health back. So the lifesteal and the health back, he's really going to be focusing on that target. He may look to swap targets right now, though, because the target is Khan. And another thing about Lex's cards like this, it's they're on kill, not elimination. So even if Khan dies and Bidey doesn't get the last hit, sorry, that card doesn't take effect. The theory behind Lex is really good, though, just because of the one thing. You do see the mark coming in, and it kind of has a dual role. Unfortunately, Bidey not going to be able to find the kill right there, yeah, although they know. do get 93%, 96 now. But it is that I'm going to accrue more credits the better they're doing. I can kill them, and it'll mean something for me. That is true. Unfortunately, like you said, the target was Khan, and while it looked like it might go his um, way, he fell apart fast. <laughs> you forgot, though. Even though they got the kill, Loomzy was still alive with Torvald for a little while, so he got two kills. <laughs> you know, he just killed both of their damage dealers uh, pretty quickly by himself. And so now Khan is by himself, and this is not a secured push. Normally, if you get that type of win, 
You can zone out on Frozen Guard, but it's going to give time for Bork to get back as a full team. And that was all kind of Bitey's pressure. Well, it was a couple of kills coming out in the right times, but him coming back stopped them from moving forward. Now 99% standing on it. Overtime sticking down. People yeah. on Zenith have to dance around this boy, but Mage Monkey is locked to the side. Bitey's Lex really may just be working to try to get this ultimate off. That could be what it is. Oh, Bitey gets baited out there, but Mage Monkey loses the shield, and he gets the slow uh, evaded. However, it's just going to work out to give the triple kill the Loomsie. I mean, you thought you had to <laughs> thought you had to worry about him, but when you're worried about Bitey this much, I almost feel like Bitey's saying, hey, I'm attacking him, I'm attacking him. They're all looking at me. Kill him, Loomsy. Loomsy's like, okay. Lex in this comp is literally just getting in your face just and screaming. Like, it's just like, look at me, look at me. I've got me. pistols. They're maybe obnoxiously loud. Uh, boom, 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 boom. I have an execute. Huh? You have to be scared of me. Don't look at Loomsy, please. Hey, look, look over here, okay? <laughs> And then he just runs in with the claws and <laughs> slices them down, quite literally, yeah. from a distance. But double kill, Watkins picking oh. some slack up for the team. It's not hard one, I want to say, or it's a hard one fight. It is not easy for Bork here. Yeah. They just have to get things rolling pretty much the way they did in that last fight. Well, you see, Loomsy, there's uh, not a better snowball champion in the game than COVID Claws right now. I mean, if anyone's just isolated 1v1 or low or retreating from a fight, Goga Claws cleans you up much better, not only because of the range, but just because of the raw efficacy of the damage. And now you had a Torval bubble with some movement speed, 50% most likely that he's running, uh, and Toa in his loadout to give him that Wind Dancer 5. Uh, but also uh, looking at just the normal movement speed that, uh, you know, uh, Loomsy's going to have with the 12% added onto agility and his loadout, plus the normal bonus of movement speed from agility. I mean, there, he's going to outrun everyone, and there's going to be no way to get around from him. So this is just a, uh, a pretty awesome kind of showcase of unique, distinct, uh, and probably uncounterable drafting right now, the way that Team Zenith have approached it. And I'm, I'm going to throw Nini under the bus for a second, just okay. because he did something I think front lines need to be aware of, and that is Lex, when he does use his auto-aim ability, when yep. it comes through, it's going to target the closest champion to him. Yep. Barrick took a like two steps behind Leon and yeah. ended up resulting yep. in that. Like those kinds of plays, those small changes, yep. that are what will make or break yep. Bitey's success here, right? It's not necessarily can Bitey find the shots, can he find the position? Yeah. It's how do you react to Bitey? Do right. you make that small slip up? Have you played against Lex enough to kind of have that in your mind? Because right. those small plays, you're looking at him, you're focused on him. If he gets a kill and then you have Lumsy doing this, <laughs> you have no chance. Holding left mouse button, if you have him doing that? Yeah. I the mean, hardest thing in the game. Yeah. He's got to hit Q, yeah. switch, and then, you know, swing a bunch. Yeah. Nick talks about gifts from Garrett. <laughs> this was a gift from, from God. This wasn't even, this couldn't have been Garrett. This is much more powerful than Garrett. Whoever gave this gift to Koga. Um, and we're going to see it again, like I said. The only surprise I have is maybe just the ch the Two. difference in the valuation Team Zenith have had on Koga. Because they've had opportunities to pick him twice now and haven't. Uh, they also had an opportunity to ban Co uh, Torvald away. They didn't. And I just wonder, would you rather play against an Inara or a Torvald Koga? And I'm just thinking, <laughs> let the Inara be. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, just showcase it's all, you already your got team the last round. Yeah. Like, it, you can deal with it, but you can't necessarily deal with anything like this. Yes, you're going to be able to get back on Leon, but Flame, <laughs> is that going to be worthwhile? You do the roll, but everyone is dying. And, you know, while we have a little bit of time here, <laughs> I'm going to say you mentioned Garrett. Yeah. And I want everyone to join me and trying to get and convince Garrett that okay. if or when he, he ever has kids, mm -hmm. that one of them has to be named Apple. Apple? So they will be Apple Martini. Apple Martini. Oh, man. <laughs> he can name one chocolate, too. Chocolate, chocolate martini. martini. I mean, it, there's so much fun he could have with it. His kids would probably hate him, you know, he could but also, it'd be perfect. He could name his kid Jim, so he could order a Jim, Mar uh, Jim Martini. And he'd be like, you want, wait, a gin martini? He's like, no, nah, my name's Jim Martini. I'll actually have mine with vodka. And you're like, oh, wow, that's strange. <laughs> Would have, wouldn't have thought. Yeah, I actually prefer gin, but because of my name, I, I can't order it. I, I, get, I, just, I, I just get made fun of all night. None of them would ever yeah. want to have a martini <laughs> in their life. I don't. I, I should ask Garrett one day if he likes martinis or not, if that's he does, he a does. point of contention for him. No, he likes them. They're, he's not like, I'm a martini guy, but, you know, he'll have them. It's just, it's funny to have your last name be that. <laughs> uh, but, you know, some people even do it purposefully. You know those people oh, yeah. named, like, uh, you know, Johnny Sports, you know, and he's like a sportscaster for 
ESPN. There's not a real guy named Johnny Sports, but that idea exists. In, uh, and I've seen a lot of people have like names that are like... Evan Paladins. Evan remember, Paladins, you know, yeah. The famous yeah. Rain Day. <laughs> <laughs> Legally changed your name just Rick to make sure. Rick Ryder, Rick Author. You know, you've never heard of Rick Author's books? <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. So much. Dan TV. He's a great, great director. A great director. Yeah. Comes out with the most brilliant movies you've probably never heard of. Yeah. No, but like names that are kind of like show yeah, names. Yeah, I know, you know? what you, yeah, no, like, I know like, what you mean. Like, like Jeff Comedy, like or something like that. Like you see a guy and you're like, oh, Jeff, Jeff jokes. It's like, oh, okay. I wonder if it gets confusing. Oh, I guess I was gonna say, I wonder if it gets confusing when you have a name like that. But then again, we go by Rain Day Cormier yeah. all the time. I don't get we confused can't when judge. someone decides to call me William. Like uh, it's <laughs> the same thing. I don't judge, Scores. <laughs> Part of my old karma. I've evolved. I've been enlightened. And uh, Baller Steve has been enlightened too. Koga Claws, welcome. He has found out that Quadra Kills exist, but guess who got it? Not Koga, it was Bitey. Yeah. Sneaking in, getting those last hits. You son of, you son of a gun. Koga, actually the only one in there making sure Bitey couldn't get the Penta. Wow. So make sure you tag Loomsy after this with all of your uh, hate. Maybe Bitey's gonna uh -huh. start spamming it out. He's the Penta denier for the game. Yeah, Bitey, you know. <laughs> Has to steal the show. We talk about Bitey <laughs> enough, and then you have to do stuff like that, Bitey. Like, give your teammates some... The chance. Some chances. Some opportunities. It's always fun to watch these games, though, and always good <laughs> to see Bitey's team and the Borkers uh, play. Let's take a look at the post-game stats, as that one uh, will be wrapping up. Greek dominant performance. Big points that you've learned after watching that set core. I mean, credit... And where credits do Baller Steve keeps up in healing, actually surpasses Snakes, although you could maybe say that's because he had way more targets to heal than Snakes ever did. Bitey, Loomsy up there. Bitey notably, 72k Top damage. damage like, baby. I mean, being able to find it, again, everyone's looking at Lex. Everyone's Look at that damage Lex. taken from Bitey. Koga's doing a lot, but <laughs> it's going to all be on the back of that Lex making a big difference. Bitey almost took as much damage as Kresnik on the front line. Bitey was basically a <laughs> front line flank. It said, just look at me. It really did happen. Well, the man did it. I, you know what? I appreciate seeing Lex, and I appreciate seeing him be successful for the first time in, like, yeah. since, like, Speedy Gonzalez Lex existed yep. in, like, the summer of last year for, like, the one week that it was allowed. Boy. Man, <laughs> the second that we saw, you know, Koga come out, things got real, real bad. Uh, real bad, real fast. Real bad, real fast uh, for the boys against Borkers. And I think that's going to tell a, a tell a story as we continue on. We're going to go on a quick break, but we'll be right back with the North American finals here for this week. These two teams, Borkers and I, oh my God, I forgot who's in. Ferocity. Ferocity are guaranteed a spot now in week four, but we'll see who takes the top seating right after this.